This episode of the Structural Engineering Channel is brought to you by PPI, a leader in engineering exam prep for the PE Structural Exam. PPI provides expert prep courses and study resources designed to help you pass the PE Structural Exam the first time. PPI's PE Structural course is fully updated and taught with October 2021 code references and includes new editions of their PE Structural books. PPI's live online courses include hours of lectures, problem-solving demonstrations, exam strategy sessions, office hours, and a passing guarantee. When you take a live online course, PPI guarantees you will pass or you can take the on-demand course for free. PPI has helped engineers achieve their licensing goals since 1975. Check out PPI today at PPI, the number two, pass.com to see all of the resources available for PE structural exam prep. Again, that's PPI, the number two, P-A-S-S dot com. Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. In this episode, Matt and I are going to review our top 10 most listened to episodes since the podcast started, and we'll also talk about some great lessons we have learned from the podcast episodes. I'm your co-host, Matt McCardle. And I'm your co-host, Kara Green. Let's jump right in. So Matt, now that we've recapped all of 2021, let's talk about some of these key episodes. I know I always love a good recap list. I've been listening to my Spotify 2021 list on recurrence all of December. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really interesting to see. I'm excited to go through these because it's kind of like the, I know there was a lot of lessons learned, but it's interesting to see what were the most listened to and what were the most uh, interesting lessons that uh, we got from these episodes. So let's start off with episode number 10. Uh, This episode was our 10th most listened to episode. And this was uh, way back in uh, episode number 35, where we talked to Drew Dudley, uh, PESE, who was the vice president at Dudley Dunham Engineering and a lecturer at Texas A&M University about the state of structural engineering and higher education. Uh, I remember him talking about basically more of the research dominated uh, aspects of structural engineering and how the universities, their research can go back into and benefit the the practical uh, industry side of structural engineering and how they kind of feed off each other. Like I know there's kind of like a versus like academia versus uh, industry and how they kind of go back and forth but a lot of the codes and I remember we talked about this a lot of the codes I mean we need the researchers for that because all the codes are based off of the research and uh, I just found it interesting and I liked how he he put it like they both need each other it's kind of like a versus relationship but they both need each other and uh, one of the things that I remembered from that episode was uh, basically, like if the structural engineers were complaining about the codes, well, why don't they go down the code committees? It was, it's like uh, they don't <laughs> stop complaining if you don't want to make a difference. But a lot of like the researchers are on those code code committees. So I think that was one of the things that was really interesting is um, uh, we both like have a symbiotic relationship, but we can both help each other in the industry and uh, in academia and the code research. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's always really interesting to kind of, we've talked to a lot of people on this channel, I believe, who have that academic research uh, background. So the PhDs, and then sometimes they translate into the field and start working with customers in a, a regular structural engineering design role. And it's always an interesting relationship between the structural engineer and the academic, and especially when they kind of mishmash together. Um, He also said that students, you know, because he is heavily involved in the university as a lecturer um, who are looking for co-ops or internships should show that they are passionate about what they're doing on their LinkedIn profiles. Um, And that companies always check references so that they should supply the company with references that can be trusted. And this was really interesting. And I thought, so when I moved to Texas, I, you know, I, at the time I didn't have a position yet. So I moved to Texas and then started looking instead of trying to find someone who would relocate me. 
And I remember um, I was in a networking opportunity and there was a gentleman who he was, he worked in um, the engineering and industry. So like with a, um, more in like the pipeline field. So that sort of uh, engineering. And he actually helped me fill out my LinkedIn profile to make it more desirable to companies because he was like, if you want to compete in the Houston market, this is what you need to do. And at the time, I, I wasn't necessarily fresh out of college. I had been with my other company for a, a, of a solid year as a staff engineer, but he really helped me out with my LinkedIn and making myself more desirable to, um, I would say, the more competitive market that is in Texas. So yeah, Drew gave a lot of really great information for both uh, talking through academics and structural engineers and how we can have a very nice, I guess, mutually beneficial relationship. And then also for our younger audience, you know, some benefits towards fluffing up, fluffing up the LinkedIn profile. Yeah, it was great advice. And LinkedIn's very relevant now. And he basically said, hey, we look at your LinkedIn profile. And I think he even brought up an example of he was looking at uh, a candidate and basically just asked them for an interview because of what they had on their LinkedIn profile. So it's something that employers do and it's something to take in mind. And uh, like you mentioned, I think the best way to do it is get help from hopefully some an industry professional. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like yes. Find way. a mentor yeah. who will help you out. Or like, I know it sounds really bad and, you know, everyone gets the notification that someone has viewed your LinkedIn pro- profile, but find someone in the position that you would like and see if you can see their roadmap to success and fluff yourself out accordingly. <laughs> yeah. What's good, what's not, and what works. Yeah. And awesome. Let's get into episode number nine, our nine most viewed episode, which was episode 32. And in that episode, we talked to Jason B. Lloyd, PhD, PE, and he was a bridge steel specialist at NSBA about redundancy and steel bridges, uh, steel and failure critical members. And we basically learned that there are certain aspects of engineering that can't be scaled. And we, I remember him talking about the, the fatigue and fracture, some of the research that they were doing and some of the testing that they're doing, uh, basically the importance of fatigue and even the inspections that it's important to get inspected uh, for those, especially with, you know, with some of the kind of recently bridge failures that we've been seeing. Definitely, Matt. And so, you know, fatigue, of course, is the resistant and has random distribution of flaws that are introduced through material processes. I think uh, common fatigue I hear about is a bunch of like after dynamic loading, the constant loading that happens on structures, especially things like bridges, you know, it, it, it does put stress on the structure and all of um, the steel. So I completely agree. And also we learned that bridges should be inspected every two years, no matter how old the bridge is, (laughs) which I think is really important. I mean, the construction process, you know, and design process, we are getting more innovative, but still, no matter how big and beautiful a bridge is, it still needs to be inspected, even if it is brand new. Once that two-year mark hits, it should be looked at just to make sure everything is going correctly. Yeah, for such important structures, uh, and I think they're finding out in their research too, they're always finding out new things about, you know, the inspection process and about the the steel bridges and the importance of those, because sometimes, like we see it on the news, like, hey, this bridge had this weird bolt connection, and it's like failing, and uh, failures that are, are happening in bridges, I mean, it's, it's happening in the US, so I think it's, it's great to bring that up and the importance of that. Yeah. And I think one other thing that I'll mention here is, you know, one thing that's really interesting about the U.S. is certain cities are always growing. And so when a bridge was construction, let's say it had a lifetime of 100 years because that was a relevant lifetime at the time of construction. You know, they weren't expecting maybe a certain populous growth or that bridge being used by a certain amount of people every single day. So, yeah, I think it's always great to kind of go back and revisit the loading requirements and make sure everything's kosher with the uh, the bridges, especially because, I mean, people rely on them every single day just to get from point A to point B. So let's talk about our next, which is our eighth most listened to episode, which was episode number 29. So there it was, 
we discussed or we talked with Professor Dr. Olivier Vassart, Chief Executive Officer of Stelligence at our cellar metal about fire engineering, about why structures need to be constructed in line with the fire safety codes and regulations. I remember him saying that if all the different parts of construction are built to be optimum, then you rarely have an optimum structure. So you need to make a sacrifice somewhere to optimize the entire structure. Yeah, and I remember him talking about the, the fire engineering and how that topic is becoming more and more relevant uh, throughout the world. It, in Euro codes and even in the US codes. I know there's uh, uh, engineers that are specializing in fire engineering, the, like structural fire engineering and performance-based design of, of fire engineering as well and where it's actually needed because even though it's not one of the main things that we study in school, once you get into the industry and you learn about all these different code requirements for uh, for fire codes and fire safety, it's, it's, a, it's a big, uh, concern and it's relevant and it affects like the, the structural design and uh that's really important for the public because i'm sure there's those great fires that people are really scared of and if they're trapped in a building how are they going to get out so making sure all all those things are in place and are properly studied and designed uh it was a great conversation to to have with them yeah and i would even say um and i i mentioned to you this this to you, Matt, you know, there's actually a really good ASCE design guide around structural fire engineering. And one of the, um, I would say main projects or main, um, yeah, I, I would say projects, unfortunately, is the Twin Towers is that was one of the main, I guess, what do you call it? A focus of the research around structural fire engineering. So one of the main case studies that the author focused on was um, there was a couple of floors in particular that were heavily impacted by the fire of the airplane. Um, and this is mentioned in the design guide. And that was kind of a, a key thing that he looked at was during the collapse, of course, of the Twin Towers, that was one thing that was looked at was the structural fire engineering and, you know, kind of the impact of if, if certain things had changed or had been different, or if his suggestions had been implemented, you know, would the collapse have happened? Yeah, so there's a lot of really interesting study or case studies around structural fire engineering. And like I said, there's a ASCE design guide out that is really interesting to read about and kind of what the future of structural fire engineering will look like. Yep. And it's definitely an important topic, especially uh, during those case studies, when it does happen, it does it bring a, a big public perception on Hey, what are we doing with these buildings? Look, we're, we're studying it, or we know what we're doing, and the importance <laughs> of fire engineering. <laughs> Moving on to our seventh most listened episode, which was episode number three way back then. Uh, we talked to uh, Ron Hamburger, who was a senior principal at Simpson, Gumperts, and Heger, and Evan Reese, uh, who was the co founder of the US Resiliency Council. Uh, we talked to them about uh, base isolation and what I remember about these is I remember we were discussing even some articles about uh, different countries like where, Japan, where it is more uh, acceptable to use base isolation. How come we're not using base isolation in the U.S.? And one of the things that was interesting that we talked about and kind of uh, was like the culture of, let's just say, U.S. versus Japan. Uh, in Japan, they were talking about psychologically wise, you know, they were hit with a lot more earthquakes than us here. Uh, in California re in the last couple decades. So their, I guess their fear factor of earthquakes is, is pretty high. And an interesting thing that we talked about was, you know, when they're on a train in Japan, when they're advertising apartments, they, they advertise base isolation uh, because your typical like citizen is going to know about earthquakes. They're scared about earthquakes. And when they're looking for a place to live, they want to be protected from earthquakes. So seismic isolation was actually a selling point over there and that was something that the public wanted because uh, because of that over here in the west coast we haven't really been hit by anything major major in the last couple decades uh and so it's not really in the fear of the of the public i think maybe the perception is oh yeah we get hit by earthquakes all the time nothing really happens it just hasn't hit in the right location uh, so it's not really a selling factor for 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 people in the US, which is interesting. 
And another thing was why base isolation wasn't being used here that often was uh, the, the US codes. I think uh, when we talked to them, it was, there's a lot of uh, cost prohibitive things about the US, about the US codes about base isolation. It's basically very expensive to implement here if you wanna get it uh, used. And uh, it's, yeah, it's pretty much the code and some of the, I forget what they're called, but it, it was basically expensive to just implement them here in the US, which was uh, an interesting thing uh, from the psychological perspective and also from the, the code perspective. Yes, I think uh, money is definitely a big inhibitor <laughs> in the construction market in the US. Yeah, it's hard um, to sell. It's hard to sell uh, to your owners. <laughs> Get base isolation, it's expensive and it'll be protected from earthquakes, but then, well, if they just want to sell the building, they probably wouldn't care about, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, base isolation. Yeah, that was a great episode. And so moving on to our sixth most listened to episode, which was episode number two, we talked with David Cocky, Stephanie Slocum, and Dr. Elena Sutley at the ASCE SEI Structures Congress in Orlando. So what stood out for me from this episode is when we were talking about commodities and how too often when we complain that we are a commodity as a structural engineer is because we are looking at it from the perspective, perspective of what's in it for me, as opposed to how can I best serve my client? And I think when we change that thinking in our brain, we bring a better value proposition and thus kind of benefit ourselves financially sometimes. Yeah. And I think it was really important because, you know, the salary of structural engineers and the pay uh, that's that's an issue and something that always gets brought up but in terms of the whole industry as a whole uh, for all the things that we do and all the liability we take why are we not paid more and uh, going into this stuff I think that change of perspective yeah it, if you have that what's in it for me perspective it's kind of just you do become a commodity it's kind of just how do I make the next buck how do I win this job let's lower our prices um, if we just go super low they'll pick us because we're super cheap <laughs> and I just need to get my next paycheck paid, just so I'll do whatever it takes. Uh, versus going in the other direction, on, on, you know, it's not just about you. It's if you think more about the client, how you can best serve the client. What does the client actually want? And you can provide those services. That's when you can start getting more into uh, the premium. Uh, I guess more of the premium market where you can start charging higher prices because that's when you can. Uh, you're not just a commodity. It's, hey, you're more expensive. And yeah, we're not the cheapest engineer, but we're, we're charging a fair price. And uh, here's why. It's because, you know, we know what you care about. We know what, uh, what you really want out of this project, what's really important to you. And, and the things that you've encountered in the past that didn't go so well, you know, this is how we took care of it and how we're taking care of it. And that's when you can charge more of the the premium prices when you actually know what your client uh, has gone through and what they're looking for in the, the next uh, project. And I think a lot of um, structural engineers or engineering firms in general are kind of taking this approach now, as opposed to being this uber competitive, low baller, you know, get all the junior engineers to do the work because their, uh, time, their time card is a lot less. I remember when I was a junior engineer, what I was paid and what my supervisor and the owner of the company was paid per hour. Um, but yeah, I think we're seeing that kind of change in the industry, especially on how we approach our customers as well. Like it's less of a, here's a final project deliverable. And I think a lot of engineers are providing almost um, like a continued service, like to help with like further engineering on the building or the structure to help facilitate that connection with the customer saying like, or the owner that, you know, we're going to be with you for the entire time that you own this structure and we will help you. And I think that also is a key value driver in helping with not commoditizing our talents. So number five on our list, episode number 39, we talked with Andrew or Drew Twarek, project manager at Ruby Associates Inc. Structural Engineers about construction engineering, what it is and how it differs from regular structural engineering. He talked about why contractors need a construction engineer and he said that 
it was to ensure the safety of the workers and the structure in the design phase when they have the construction issues that they need to solve or run into problems that need repairing. And that was a great episode. And I think it's really interesting, especially because, you know, the construction phase, it's all amazing to have this beautiful design already planned out and it works perfect on paper, but the actual implementation sometimes needs a little finessing to get the um, I would say like the structural engineers, what's the right term, vision to actually happen. So I don't know about, what do you think about working with construction engineers when they're working for a contractor? I think it's really interesting. I remember when talking uh, to Drew about it, he was showing us some of his projects and they were like really interesting, uh, some really complicated scaffolding and really custom uh, engineering projects that were their own engineering projects to their own right. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I remember there were like huge billboards that or huge signages that they were trying to uh, uh, erect or install and uh, huge scaffolding structures that were that were custom. They were really interesting. And uh, I remember talking to him and he was really interested in that work. And I could see why, because these weren't your typical cut and paste projects where you can just go into a spreadsheet, <laughs> put in the numbers done. Uh, these were really custom with the structures that they were going with and finding those unique solutions that maybe no one's found ever a solution for that. I think that's where it can get really interesting when you're working in construction engineering because you're going to run into stuff that maybe no one's done before or <laughs> you'll find Most another definitely. way to do it. And I think you also have to kind of think on your feet, because if you're working as a construction engineer under a contractor, you know, your contractor is the one paying your bills and they are very time bound <laughs> if they're working for the owner. Yeah, we're building this tomorrow. <laughs> Can you give us a design? <laughs> <laughs> the building's tomorrow. You have an hour. <laughs> yeah. And then going on to our fourth most listened episode which is episode number 20 that was with stan caldwell a structural engineering consultant who primarily consults on you know construction litigation that was cool talking to him because he provided five tips for structural engineers to become the best version of themselves he gave uh, some really great tips they were uh, mind the gap ensure stability a design first then compute be a sponge and own your work. Uh, one of my favorite things was when he was going through the design process, especially for new engineers, you know, that reliance on software and uh, over-reliance on software, especially. And it was cool to see uh, how he kind of goes about training new engineers on that. And he gave like a great outline of what you should be thinking about, especially if you're new on how that building should be uh, designed and what your design and workflow process should be. Uh, so I really enjoyed that part because you kind of just gave about uh, the details on, on what, how you should know the answer first before you get into the software engineering. And you should always be doing some type of back check with your work because that stuff gets built and hopefully your company has a QC process, but sometimes that stuff can get missed and no one likes that when it goes out into the field and then you have an issue. So uh, some, some really great advice uh, over there that I enjoyed. Yeah, and I can relate to his comment about being a sponge. I remember when I was a junior engineer, I had a supervisor who literally took me on every single project that she went on to, she showed me the ropes. And it was really fortunate because, you know, she was also a female supervisor. So we got along great, <laughs> um, but she did. She definitely showed me the ropes. And um, one of the most interesting things about that company is, you know, even you're exactly right. So they checked all of my work, but they, I don't, I don't want to say they let me fail first, but they would like throw me into situations. They would be like, give me your first attempt and see where you went with it. Um, and the, after, after the review process, they would give me their correction or they would be like, no, that's actually a solid, that's a solid approach. So, um, yeah, that be a sponge comment is it hits hard and it just reminds me of my time being a junior engineer and all of the things that I had to absorb to become impactful in my job and turn over some revenue for the company. <laughs> yeah, I know it's, uh, for new engineers, it's always, you know, ask questions, ask the questions, ask the questions. 
because you're talking to someone probably that has like 20, 30, 40 plus years of experience. A lot of the things come second nature to them. It's like driving a car uh, for so long. You kind of just forget about what you're doing. And it's like, isn't this common knowledge to everybody? But you as a new engineer have to remind them, <laughs> you know, it's like it's my first time seeing this. And uh, that's why asking those questions uh, can really help you stand out in your career, uh, because not only it shows that you're willing to learn, uh, but the questions that the type of questions that you ask can really uh, make a good impression on your project managers. Most definitely. And so moving on to our third most listened to episode, episode number 40, Alexis actually interviewed you, Matt. And here is where you kind of provided some helpful tips on how to prepare for the SE exam. And you talked about what the exam is, why it's so difficult, and the benefits of earning an SE licensure. So Matt, do you want to give our listeners an update on how things went with the exam? Yeah, that's, it was, I remember that uh, interview and uh, the difficulty of, of it for sure. There's two parts to it. And I remember I passed the first part, but then uh, yeah, I'm still trying to pass that second part, uh, which is the SE lateral. And uh, yeah, it's difficult. <laughs> I'm still taking it. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of just those things that, yeah, it's a hard test. And uh, like, I'm studying for it again. And yeah, like the advice that I would give, uh, you know, kind of uh, reminiscing about that episode is, uh, yeah, keep trying. It's keep studying. It's, it's a tough test and the pass rates are are really low. I, I know, <laughs> for, Do you know especially a for the SE lateral, it changes every year, but some of the things that I've seen were about, I think I've seen like a 75% uh, fail rate or 25% pass rate. <laughs> <I was> gonna... <laughs> I thought you were going to say pass. I was like 75%. <laughs> no, yeah. Oh, so, so it's a difficult test and, you know, for any engineers that are studying for it, uh, yeah, don't underestimate the test. Uh, try your best, and if you fail, just keep going at it. And you know, don't put all all of your uh, self identity into these tests. They're they're tough tests, and uh, a lot of the stuff you're not even gonna know or don't even work with. So you know, just uh, if it's your goal to get that, uh, just keep trying. Uh, there's plenty of people that didn't pass, and you know, don't put yourself down or think you're not a good engineer, because. Uh, yeah, a lot of these tests, you, you don't even work with them. So it's, it's a, uh, just keep trying and uh, you'll eventually get it. Yeah. And I think that's great advice to even, even younger engineers who may be an EIT taking their PE. Like I remember my supervisor ended up taking the PE twice and got it the second time. I mean, these tests are just standardized ways of testing and it encompasses multiple different applications that you may not even work with. And I know, I wanna say, I had a transportation um, professor and I remember he made the mention of like, transportation equations are very easy, but I remember like getting a transportation question on the PE exam that was like, incredibly difficult. And I was like, <laughs> Did I miss something? <laughs> I don't remember this. But uh, yeah, no, that's great advice. And I think also about putting your identity into a test, like remove all ego. <laughs> it does yeah. not matter. <laughs> yeah, you talk to enough people and some of the smartest engineers that uh, I've known and that other people have known, you think they pass on the first time, but then you'll be surprised on how many of them uh, took it or retook it or just gave up on it because like they're a bridge engineer and they don't really need their SE license, but they're like some of the most uh, 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 intelligent and smart engineers that are, that are out there. And um, yeah, you don't need a license to do that, but you may need a license for, you know, other things like state licensor and stuff, but mm -hmm. yeah. And moving on to our second most listened to episode, which was episode uh, number 57. In this episode, we talked to Emily Guglielmo, uh, the past president of the National Council of Structural Engineers Association, or NCSEA, and the Structural Engineers Association of Northern California. And this one, we talked about building safety in response to the Surfside building collapse in Miami. We talked about, you know, the engineer's role in post-collapse and uh, how the collapse uh, 
especially that particular event affected or will affect the building codes and uh, the public perception of structural engineers in general. Yeah, most definitely. And we, we talked to her very closely after the collapse. So it was very interesting to see how this will affect in the future. Um, but one of the things that I recall is that she talked about the three roles of a structural engineer in post collapse. So first, of course, is the role to help with search and rescue and to help the first responders to work through in the safest, safest possible conditions. So this is always really interesting because I was talking with family, family members about Surfside and they're like, well, why don't they just all rush in and get all of the people out? And I'm like, that building is collapsed. Like it's not safe for even people to try and go in right now let alone try and pull people out at this time. So, you know, of course, that's the first role is to help try and help stabilize the structure in a way that we can serve and rescue efforts. And then the second role, of course, is the forensic and the technical investigation into the cause of the collapse. So this is like the, the fact finding mission of determining what actually caused uh, the collapse in the first place. And then third, and this is when um, this role is kind of very interesting because this is when a structural engineer gets involved um, to make changes to the building codes, um, how drawings are permitted, the quality assurance process, um, building maintenance, and then licensure requirements. So it was very, it was very interesting to talk about her thought process on the three role, three key roles of the structural engineer um, following a tra a tragedy like that. Yeah, it was. I remember one of the things that stood out that we talked about was, uh, you know, the public reaching out to structural engineers, uh, especially the news out outlets and even training about how to respond to the public media, because the public media, you know, when they reach out to a structural engineer that's never gotten publicity, they just might want to get on like the talk show or whatnot and talk about, oh yeah, I think X, Y, Z happened because of X, Y, Z. And that, that's probably not the best approach that I, you know, the best approach that we came up with when we talked to her was, Hey, wait for the official reports. Cause there's so many things, so many factors that could have happened and that could have triggered it. And um, you know, the, the news outlets, they're not looking for the truth. They want something sensational or, Oh, this engineer said this, and this is why it failed. And then they'll, that'll blow up. And then that may not be true. And that's something that, that we don't want to happen as you know, the structural engineers. Uh, the investigation was still ongoing. And then maybe a structural engineer said something or maybe even the, you know, the media would clip that would just a clip of it, <laughs> like saying something out of context. <laughs> and then that could potentially blow up in, on the internet, especially. Uh, so things like that, it's, it's, it's stuff that we need to be aware of as structural engineers, especially since we don't have, uh, you know, a lot of public media, uh, I guess, exposure uh, on there. So it, it was really interesting to, to talk about. Yeah, exactly right. I think uh, obviously you and me, you and me, Matt, we are on this uh, podcast and we talk all the time and I know that we have listeners, but it's very interesting to have if you don't have a consistent conversation with the public, it can be very um I would say shocking or almost like paralyzing to provide a very like thoughtful response. So you're exactly right. What Emily said, where she was like, you know, take a pause before you respond in any sort of way that may seem official just by your degree or your profession. Um, and wait until the professionals or the actual forensic engineers on the project come out with a statement. And going on to our final episode, our most listened to episode is episode number 28, where we talked to Mostafa Elmogi, PhD, uh, where he talked about the design of high rises and the structural engineering profession. And he discussed the procedure for like wind tunnel testing uh, for high rises. Uh, I remember he was talking about some of the projects that he did and all the things that go into high rise design that may not go into you know, your typical one or two story buildings. Uh, it was really interesting to see the software that he used, the construction methods, and even the whole wind tunnel testing. Uh, you can't just go into the codes and go to a table and find the wind loads. They actually had to do mock-up models and, and whatnot, and even some of the construction challenges that they faced. Uh, 
just to get a, a high rise building up. So that was a really interesting episode where uh, he talked about that. Yeah, I think I think wind tunnel testing is so interesting. I um, I've attended certain talks about wind tunnel testing and how they do the procedure, and it's just I think it was was it um, ASC seven sixteen where they updated the wind loads wasn't yeah, that a lot correct? of uh, wind changes in the latest code mm-hmm. yeah yeah and I feel like wind tunnel testing has become even more prevalent since then and I know in, when I worked in Houston wind was a big issue because we were right along the coastline and um yeah I think we had high rises I don't recall I'm not super familiar with wind tunnel testing on high rises but I'm the more familiar with it for um like roof diaphragm attachments and that sort of thing. So it is really interesting. I, it was a good conversation. Yeah. And I remember when we were discussing, I think that portion of it, the wind tunnel testing, uh, even the, the way it's it shaped the high rise structure, uh, since wind is, if in those cases, wind was a, a huge factor. And I think you can see it in like the latest high rises, like the architecture, uh, would even be influenced by, uh, by the wind tunnel test because uh, you know how, how it behaves during the actual wind tunnel testing, they could shape or they could adjust the shape of the high rise to maybe funnel uh, the wind through, uh, you know, uh, to the basically reduce the wind loads mm-hmm. uh, and have less drag on the structure. And it was interesting to see how the architecture would be affected by that. And even just the solutions that were coming from like the structural engineers, if uh, Maybe if you shaped it this way, or maybe if you had an opening here, even uh, that could greatly reduce some of the wind loads. So that that would be so cool to see in person. <laughs> I keep like there's this video that keeps popping up on my LinkedIn, and it is of a shake table, and I think it's like um it's something it for seismic in California where it's students who build like a popsicle stick building and they put it on a shake table and they see kind of how long it lasts. I wonder if ASCE, I'm kind of like, (laughs) this is a hearty suggestion. We need a popsicle stick test for a high rise, but with like a wind tunnel. So let's get one of those industrial grade fans and (laughs) see if we can (laughs) Yeah, that'd be interesting. (laughs) <laughs> Dude, almost like the what was it I I remember concrete canoe that was the big one when I was in school or um oh this the the bridge design contest for ASCE the student chapters but it would be interesting to see if we could at some point do a test on wind testing for students and do like a high-rise popsicle stick <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe ways situation. to make the most uh aerodynamic <laughs> Yeah, it's getting into like uh, racing cars and uh, the aerodynamics of cars and uh, airplanes. Mm -hmm. Uh, But that's a thing for buildings too. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So just the ASCE, if anyone from ASCE listens and does those competitions, just a suggestion. (laughs) I would watch. And that wraps it up for this episode. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. It was great to time and talk through the top 10. Yeah, it was really interesting to reminisce about all those episodes and all the lessons that we learned. Uh, so yeah, make sure to uh, go check out the structuralengineeringchannel.com and uh, to check uh, these episodes out. I hope you enjoyed the episode today. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you will find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 70 as well as any links to the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.